So it's telling me, Tom, that we are now live here on YouTube. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to buffer out uh, and to, to get all that ready. Uh, but today in the rundown, we're going to be looking at a one of the main stories we're going to be looking at is a new story all about how um, COVID-19 is affecting digital transformation. You know, there was we've talked about, it, I think, on the show, even uh, there was that tweet that what's driving your digital transformation, CEO, CIO, COVID-19. Ha ha ha. Um, funny the first 300 times I saw it. Uh, but I actually reflects a reality and we're seeing some actual uh, survey results to kind of bear that out, which I think is super interesting. And we are going to talk about it. Otherwise, Tom, uh, a, a super sparkly Wednesday for you or. Yeah, as sparkly as can be. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's bright. Mm -hmm. I'm discovering the joys of recording in a garage um, when the humidity is high and the temperature is in the 80s. Um, so if you see the glistening of, uh, of perspiration, it's not because Tom's grilling me. Um, it is uh, because it is a little steamy in here. Uh, but luckily, I have hot coffee to help uh, keep it going. You know, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, right? Exactly. It can't get any worse. Uh, so uh, Tom, what do you say we get the show on the road? Let's do this. All right. In three... Two, one. Hello, all, and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, your weekly look at the IT News of the Week. I'm your host, Rich Straffolino. I'm an editor with Gestalt IT. Joining me from across this great land of ours is the one, the only, the networking nerd himself, Tom Hollingsworth. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on again, Rich. Um, we're we're getting good at this whole thing, even when there's not news. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, I was just reflecting on this. It's getting close to about four years that we have been doing the rundown uh, in one form and platform or another. So uh, always a pleasure there. But you know what also is a pleasure, Tom? A little something we like to call news or not. This is when even in a relatively slow news week, there's a few items that I'm not sure our news or not. We don't need to necessarily have a full discussion, but I want Tom's take on them. Uh, I'm going to trademark that if it's not already on the Networking Nerd blog, but we're going to get it started out uh, with a company near and dear to both of our hearts, uh, HPE. They announced after a lackluster earnings report, a plan uh, for some new cost savings that are going to account for about $1 billion in cost savings through 2022. Starting July 1st, CEOs, officers at the executive vice president level, and the board of directors will have base salaries cut by 25%. CEO Antonio Neri has also said the company will realign its workforce to evolve its with its real estate strategy, basically estimating he expects to go remote about 50% of the workforce that will never come back to the office. Although if you read it in a certain way, it means they're going to fire 50% of their staff. I don't think that's the case. It just is a weird way of saying never come back to the office. That's like that's like soft HR for firing. Uh, so Tom, news or not that HP's uh, 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 doing some cost savings here. This is news because they really do need to get their costs down. But the thing that wasn't in the news, and this is something I'm hearing from insiders, this is not the, just the executives and the board who's taking a pay cut. The entire company is taking a minimum 10% pay cut across the board, effective immediately. Wow. And will they will get that money back after the end of the HP fiscal year, which starts November 1st. So basically, be glad you have a job. You just have 90% of your job. Um, <laughs> yes, I am hearing from people that there's going to be a massive shift in the way that the company looks at real estate, uh, office, and things like that. Uh, there is a number that's being floated around that says maybe they're looking to cut a billion dollars. That's billion with a B like in Bravo, which means you're not going to get there just by reducing salaries. Now, the flip side of this, yeah, and I, I, I hate to bring it up, um, this is not being driven by the by the landscape. This is not being driven by employees. This is being driven by those greedy money grubbing shareholders that want their pound of flesh every week so that they can make their yacht payments. Do you think we'll see, you know, kind of as a result of that, do you think we'll see any of the uh, on the enterprise side, any companies rumbling about going private as a result? Where are they going to find the money? Pressure to off? Where are they going to find the money to go <laughs> private? That, that's the biggest mm. problem. They've sold their souls over and over and over again to people like Elliott Management that, that want their money. So there's no cash left because hmm, maybe if they'd have saved that money instead of doing stock buybacks, they actually would have you know made money. All right. Next up here, a company that has no problem making money, but maybe keeping their source code in check. The Verge reports that source code for the original Xbox and Windows NT 3.5 leaked online. The Xbox leaks include the kernel, which was a custom kernel based on Windows 2. 
thousand, as well as build environments, the Xbox development kit, and emulators used for testing. Tom Warren at the Verge reports that this code has been privately shared uh, by the homebrew enthusiasts uh, before, so they don't look like it's going to you know crack anything uh, that hasn't kind of already been out there already. The leak of Windows NT 3.5 appears to be based on a near final version and includes all necessary build tool. Microsoft loves open source now, but probably not the way they wanted it. News or not, here, Tom? This is news because any source code leak is news. But if you think this is going to move the needle at all, you're terribly, horribly <laughs> wrong. Um, you're leaking a version of Windows NT that's from the 90s. Congratulations, you have an old hobby kit thing. You're not going to recompile this into source that runs. The Xbox leak would be the bigger one, except there isn't an emulation system on the planet that's going to touch this code, because as soon as it gets into the system, that gives Microsoft the right to pull any kind of emulation software that uses it claiming IP theft. So news that someone got in and stole stuff, not so news that it'll actually ever get used anywhere. All right, Tom, I need a uh, I need a heat check, I guess, on this one, because I don't get the enthusiasm that I'm seeing for it. Microsoft announced an update for the Outlook for Windows client that will allow users to configure email signatures to be saved to the cloud rather than individual clients and machines. Signatures will be tied to a Microsoft 365 account and be loaded from the cloud for all sent messages. People seem weirdly excited about this. I kind of don't get it. Like, I understand it's inconvenient, right, to reset your signature on your phone or whenever you set up a new machine. But Tom, why? <laughs> Why? Oh. This this seems like Microsoft 2005 is like super excited that they figured out cloud email signatures. I'll, I'll tell you, I saw a tweet about this a couple of days ago and someone's like, I can finally do this. I'm like, you couldn't before? Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm one of those people that has just like a text expander shortcut that's my email signature across everything. And I have like five different ones for whatever email that I'm sending. I didn't know this wasn't a thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can can we maybe form a consortium to kill email signatures in general? Like, do we do we need your about.me on the bottom of everything? I, I'm I was, fine. I don't need to know what it's sent from. I accept whatever your your punctuation is. And and I'm pretty sure that you know, if this email was sent for the non-intended recipient and all disclosure, blah, blah, blah. I just want to sue somebody over that and see if it holds up in court. And if it doesn't, which I'm pretty sure it doesn't, we can get rid of the stupid thing. All right, speaking of getting rid of things, last week, Texas Instruments announced that the latest firmware updates for the popular TI-84 Plus CE and TI-83 Premium CE graphing calculators will remove support for assembly and C-based programs. Once updated to the new firmware, existing apps won't run, and the firmware cannot be rolled back. At least that's what TI is saying. According to the president of EdTech for TI, Peter Balka, the move was made to prioritize learning and minimize any security risks, aka cheating. Uh, he And he hopes that hobbyist community, uh, which is understandably a little upset by this, will help guide TI's development of the Python programming language on the platform. Tom, news or not? I don't think it's news, except for the people that like playing Snake on their TI calculators. <laughs> um, this, is, this is not about cheating. But let's be fair. This is not about cheating. This is about people developing software to run on TI calculators that... TI wants to sell or doesn't want to run on their calculator. Oh. I mean, when's the last time you went out and tried to buy a TI-86 or a TI-89? I mean, these things hold their value better than the Ark of the Covenant. Like they're still a hundred bucks to buy one of these stupid calculators because every math textbook that's been created in the last decade or more is written around them. This is TI wanting to keep their market dominance. Shame on you, TI, for not letting me use my calculator the way I want to use it and forcing me to use it the way you want me to. Also, shout out to the Zillog Z80 chip uh, that's still rocking and rolling in all of those calculators. And finally, Rock here on, on. News... <laughs> exactly. Uh, finally, here on News or Not, Facebook announced its workplace communication platform now has 5 million paid users, up 2 million as of the end of March. So just kind of at the start of a lot of the COVID lockdowns. The company also announced that Messenger Rooms is available on Workplace, letting users quickly start up group video calls, as well as support for inviting non workplace or Facebook users to join by URL. That's the same thing that came to Facebook. They're just bringing it to workplace, I guess, officially. Facebook also added work groups and that lets you just kind of have smaller breakout groups similar to what Zoom is already uh, doing uh, to great effect. The company also added a live producer mode, letting video call uh, hosts start polls, share their screens and run Q and A's, which I guess you could do on a workplace video chat app. And videos now support automatic captions in English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and German. Tom, news or not? 
Anybody who's using Facebook to conduct business meetings, please see me after class because we're going to have a <laughs> long discussion about why you're an idiot. Okay. I, 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 unless you're the 50,000 people that on Facebook that now need to work from home and all the contractors that they work with that they're going to force to use workplace for Facebook as well. Like, I feel like the only reason they're embracing remote work, like half the reason, not the only reason, half the reason is just to drive growth of workplace. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, this is like when they forced all of the Google employees to get a Google Plus page and they were like 75% of the people on the platform. If your company forces, okay, if your company is not run by Mark Zuckerberg and they're forcing you to use Facebook Workplace for your meetings, quit. <laughs> I mean, maybe a grain of salt, maybe, maybe a strongly worded letter. Put in your two I'm weeks. Say we'll split the difference because they are not going to be a company that's going to pay you anything whenever this thing is over. Yeah. And just for comparison, I mean, we're, we're kind of uh, not critical, but like Google Meet has a long way to go to meet up with where Zoom is a slightly different platforms that, you know, workplace is kind of more of a Slack and Zoom kind of all in one competitor. Or if you're looking at something like Slack, I mean, something the scale of Facebook, 5 million users, adding 2 million, a lot of users to add. If you look at the growth that other services have had, though, in this environment, you know, it's not quite up to that level yet. Uh, I guess they're still invested, though, in growing that platform. I, I mean, obviously, they have a financial reason to. Mm -hmm. All right, Tom, let's get our discussion going. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, COVID-19 lockdowns, there's no secret that the reality of COVID-19 has fundamentally reshaped how businesses and specifically IT operate. But a new survey from At Dynamics puts some hard numbers to that and kind of gives us some, some scale for that, I guess, as opposed to just kind of assuming that. Their Agents of Transformation report found that 95% of responding IT pros said that their organizations had changed their technology priorities as a result of the pandemic, with 71% saying that digital transformation efforts were accomplished in weeks and what were projected to take months or even years to complete on their roadmaps. Uh, but 76% have said that they are worried about how this rush would impact the success of those initiatives, with 59% saying that they are spending most of their time firefighting and creating short-term fixes for problems that have come up, cropped up as a result. Challenges to these efforts were pretty uniform across respondents. They're basically all sitting like 80% of respondents said they had each of these problems. I think it was like 81 to 79. So I mean, right in there. Uh, and these challenges uh, include managing uh, website traffic spikes, providing a positive digital customer experience, lack of visibility into their tech stack, which I think is really interesting, and managing mean time to resolution when working with remote teams. Tom, what do you see as the long-term impacts and challenges being for IT coming out of these and any surprising numbers, I guess, in that report? IT reacts to a pandemic by enabling things and then <laughs> executives freak out because we made things work. I mean, this you could just take out the COVID-19 slash pandemic <laughs> part and put in any other random occurrence. And I mean, that's what we do. I mean, the XKCD comic of the sysadmin crawling across broken glass over gunshots to repair uh, phone wires. That's us. I mean, I know a lot of people in IT who like they had two days notice to get all the VPNs turned up and buy enough licenses and and companies that were we do not allow working from home. Uh, suddenly they had to. Yeah, this is a huge impact on people. This is understanding what your technology can enable and what you need to do. Now, there's a lot of pieces of this whole digital transformation that are not going to stick around. As soon as people can go back into the office, they're going to be required to. As soon as people mm -hmm. are able to be under the thumb of a micromanager, they're going to be under their thumb again. Because as much as we're digitally transforming the way that our knowledge workers and our users interact, you can't digitally transform bad management practices. There's always going to be people that, you know, if I can't see you, I can't manage you. If you're not sending me hourly status reports about what you're working on, then you're not actually doing anything. Even though you're producing, you know, whatever your product is, whether it's a report or other things, you can't digitally transform that. You can digitally retire those people, just have their emails go to a bit bucket somewhere or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, like... I think what we're going to start seeing is there's going to be a lot of questions being asked by knowledge workers of why do I have to come into the office? Now, knowledge workers, let's be perfectly frank, you don't have to come to the office. But if you don't have to come to the office, you're going to have video conference meetings all day long with said micromanagers. So pick your poison. Do you want a desk or do you want to wear pajamas all day? Do you think we'll see, I mean, I, I guess maybe you're describing this a little bit, but in terms of, you know, uh, when cloud computing hit the scene, right? You had a bunch of companies that are like, we're going all on the cloud. We didn't refactor anything. It's a disaster. Oh my God, get us away from the cloud. 
Uh, and you kind of had that that uh, expatriation from the cloud or whatever you want to call it. Do you think we'll see something like that, you know, when we're a year out from COVID lockdowns, uh, you know, kind of coming out of effect, you have all of these kind of slapdash efforts at digital transformation or maybe uh, much more rapid implementations and stuff like that. Do you think we'll see a huge rush of people scaling back these kinds of initiatives? Or do you think that, you know, Yes, people will go back into the offices. Yes, the micromanagers, micromanagers are going to micromanage. But do you think like there's there's no a kind of going back from this now that you know ninety five percent of respondents are saying things have changed. A lot of the toothpaste is out of the tube. I mean, there's mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to put it back in. People who are very dedicated to re replacing toothpaste are going to try. <laughs> but you know, the the cloud efforts are there. The user empowerment efforts are there. The question is going to be how hard are the management and quite honestly, the shareholders going to fight against it? Mm -hmm. You know, shareholders love physical assets. We own buildings. We need to do something with these buildings. Um, you know, unless you're WeWork, you know, you, you, you create, you <laughs> have assets are your thing. And now that you're stuck with a bunch of assets, you can't get rid of because nobody's going to want to buy office space. If everybody's working from home, shareholders are going to be mad. So deal with it. Sell your yacht take your position with my company <laughs> and stick it where the yacht don't shine and let's get back to doing business. Yeah. And I will be, in, you know, I highly recommend everybody check it out. We have, we're going to have a link to that report in our show notes to check it out. There's a, there's a couple other interesting findings in there, but really to see the hard numbers and this was across, I, I apply, I applaud app dynamics. It appears that they did a really good job of being comprehensive in terms of, you know, kind of being across industries, being across, international. This isn't just us based and stuff like that. So really giving a global sense uh, across industries of how IT is responding to this, uh, definitely worth uh, checking out if you haven't. Uh, next up here, interesting news from Intel. They announced the acquisition of Rivet Networks, the makers of the killer brand of Ethernet controllers, wireless chips, and management software. Killer NICs are in laptops from Dell, Alienware, HP, and others. And Killer NICs uh, are used for you know things like reducing latency, prioritizing packets. You, you know, it's a NIC. Uh, the company will also be rolled. Uh, the the company will be rolled into Intel's wireless and Intel will continue to sell the killer branded products and license killer software to customers. PC World also reports that Intel wants a, uh, to bring the killer intelligence engine, which identifies the best Wi-Fi signals and may recommend router upgrades, uh, which I'm sure uh, customers would love. Uh, and possibly though, bringing that to Bluetooth, I think is an interesting concept. They're kind of prioritizing the radios there. Is this Intel trying to build a better uh, like platform play for their overall x86 with these kinds of acquisitions, Tom? Uh, I, I really don't know Intel's strategy anymore. I know that you know their press release really focuses on the Wi-Fi aspect of things. Maybe this is them trying to pick up steam in the the chip market after they sold off all of their uh, you know modem business to Apple. I, I just I don't know what what what's their plan. They don't make access points. They make chips that go in them, but they're behind in the market. You know. Uh, companies that do their own radio stuff, either that you buy it from a Theros or you make it yourself. And, and I just, I don't know, because this is not Centrino. This is not the old days when everything on the board was Intel and it just all kind of works together. This is, this is that, that was my first thought is that this is like the Centrino. Let's bring the band back together. We're going to make this, you know, laptop top platform that it's all Intel inside. And yes, the CPU maybe isn't per clock, com you know, uh, superior to an AMD component or something like that, or even an ARM component or something like that. But we can offer you, hey, better Wi-Fi, you'll take 5% slower GPU if your Wi-Fi is 10% more reliable or something, you know, something along those lines, that kind of argument. I do think it's really interesting though. So Rivet Networks originally, or the founders of them were Bigfoot Networks, which was then acquired <laughs> by Qualcomm and then spun out. So Qualcomm, makers of all the chips, was like, you know what, guys? Nah. <laughs> you, you guys do your thing. We're going to be happy. And Intel is now getting that IP. That's been a couple of years now. It's not like this just happened in six months or something like that. So the landscape may have changed. And Intel clearly is going to do their homework with this kind of acquisition. Just think it's interesting that if Qualcomm didn't want this IP, why it's valuable to Intel. Interesting. I think it's probably valuable to Intel so that nobody else has it. This uh, this could be true as well. Uh, speaking of things you will never have, researchers at Australia's Monash, Swinburne, and RMIT universities published an article in Nature Communications describing a new internet speed record of 44.2 terabits per second. 
for some contextualization, that's about enough to download 50 100 gigabyte 4K movies in a second. Uh, I don't know why you would do that, but you could. The researchers placed a micro comb within a cable's fibers to make data transfers more efficient and compact. If you want to, we have a link to the research paper. You can find out what a micro comb is. Otherwise, the setup used standard optical fiber and a single integrated chip source, meaning it's theoretically possible to implement this on existing fiber infrastructure. The researchers tested this over 75 kilometer connections and said that the use of shorter, a higher bandwidth connections of less than 100 kilometers, particularly between data centers, drove the need to look into creating more bandwidth over existing shorter connections, as opposed to long backhaul core connections that are thousands of kilometers. More bandwidth over the same fiber. Sounds too good to be true, Tom? Mm, not too good to be true, but rubber meets the road. I can make anything look good in a test. Um, you know, th if you don't believe me, uh, speed test your home network, whether it's cable or DSL, and tell me if you're getting exactly what they promised you or maybe a little different. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I appreciate that people are pushing the technology as far as they're going to be able to, to take it. Moore's Law is still a thing, evidently. But like this is, I, I feel like this is probably the end of the road. This is like, you know, uh, to use a different analogy, this is dumping a lot of NOS into the engine to make it go super, super fast. <laughs> uh, you are not going to be able to get much more performance out of this, and it definitely won't be able to do this for a sustained period of time. Yeah, it'll be interesting. You know, we've had uh, Tech Field Day. Uh, I remember, uh, oh, who is the uh, founder of Arista? Uh, gave a really great talk about kind of the future of, uh, you know, ultra high speed connections and stuff like that. I, I'm interested to see when this gets out of the lab and companies like Arista and stuff like that get their hands on and can see, okay, what can the, you know, is this reliable enough to actually deploy anywhere other than, you know, between you universities as a, as a science experiment? So that would be Andy Bechtelsheim. And if you head over to youtube.com yes, slash Tech Field Day, if you look on the best of Tech Field Day uh, playlist that's there on the front page, Andy's talk, that specific talk about um, silicon photonics and and the, the top end of fiber is one of the highlighted videos because it was really, really good. Yeah, it, it's, it's good stuff. Um, so maybe watch that and then uh, dig into the paper a little bit. It gets very, like, this is not a, a blog post or something like that. This is a, you know, dozens and dozens of pages of hard science. Uh, so uh, so interesting stuff, definitely. And finally, Tom, I wanted to talk about uh, GDPR. It celebrated its two-year anniversary last week, and a new report from Access Now looks at how effective the sweeping privacy regulation has actually been. According to the report, there's been 231 fines issued uh, under GDPR, most notably British Airways, I think still has the record for the biggest single fine uh, in the EU since May 2018, it was May 2018 when fines could kind of start being implemented. Uh, uh, but notably, Ireland and Luxembourg, where tech giants like Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, PayPal, Microsoft, Google, and others are located, have been issued no fines. The report also found that company uh, that most regulators feel under-resourced to take the on these giant companies with the EU's Data Protection Commissioner getting denied additional funding last year and kind of having some sour grapes about that for sure. There's no doubt that GDPR has had made at least companies openly discuss data privacy and think about data usage. I mean, every conversation, every briefing that we have with anybody touching data, Tom, I mean, uh, this has been my experience. That's front of mind, even for US based companies, because they have to operate in Europe. And that's, you know, that's definitely on the tip of everybody's tongue. But if enforcement is slow, do you think we'll see this roll back over time, Tom? No, I think that they're going to use GDPR like the boogeyman. Uh, you better do this or these guys are going to come get you and they're going to steal your children and, and eat all the cookies <laughs> in your cupboard. Um, so the, the, and you can, you can see that by the, they, they haven't rolled it back. They haven't changed any of the protections. They're still as, as, you know, as bad as ever say bad in quotation fingers, <laughs> but they don't have any money to do the enforcement. You know, they, oh, don't get me wrong. Google British airways, they got smacked hard. Mm -hmm. And those things are probably going to get tied up in litigation until all the money is going to the lawyers instead of the, the coffers of the GDPR enforcement board. This is ultimately the problem. People like the idea of things being safe. People don't actually like to make sure. It's like when you tell your kids, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to ground you. You actually have to follow <laughs> through on the threat every great once in a while. Otherwise, they don't believe you. Oh, yeah, you said you're going to ground me the last 10 times you're going to do it. But if the people who make up the board won't give the enforcement arm the power, the resources, the time to enforce those things, it's basically the same as going, yeah, who cares? All you got to do if you get caught is sue us. Let it sit in litigation for a couple of years. We'll forget all about it. The lawyers will get paid and everybody will go away happy, except for the users whose data gets exposed. 
Well, that's what a lot of smaller companies that have brought, not necessarily GDR complaints, but anti-competitive complaints in the EU against companies like Google, Facebook, stuff like that are saying is that, you know, by the time this gets to any meaningful court, we're four or five years, you know, sometimes even more out from when the complaint was actually filed. Uh, the whole landscape has changed. So it's tough for, you know, uh, just for a properly staffed regulator. And, uh, you know, Marguerite Vestager, it seems like she has the resources she needs to go after some of these companies, but the timing that it takes, it makes it usually a moot point by that point because the complaining company has gone out of business or has you know been acquired or shifted focus or something like that and there's not necessarily any public will also to put additional pressure on people because it's so long ago so it, it will be interesting i know there's been uh, some rumblings uh with gdpr enforcement specifically looking at trying to take it away from more nationalized enforcement for some of these larger cases and allow that to be kind of you know, to, to allow countries to kind of pool their resources together to, you know, to theoretically investigate and go after, if necessary, complaints about privacy from some of these big companies. Because, yeah, um, you know, uh, Ireland only has so much buzz at Luxembourg, you know, not the biggest country in the world. So the it, it will be interesting to see how that is refined over time. I will say, but most of the defenders of GDPR will say, you know, two years for this kind of regulation, given the scope that it's after, given the scope of the companies that we're going after is kind of, you know, we're, we're just starting to kind of experience the realities of this where we're finding it over time. Uh, so we will see uh, uh, if it, you know, which way it goes. If this is the boogeyman, like you said, or um, if this is a, uh, a strict but loving parent. Uh, speaking about strict but loving, Tom, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your time. Uh, where can people find more of your great work if they are so inclined? Well, the best place to go uh, where I've been producing most of the, the content is gestaltit.com. Uh, just search for Tom Hollingsworth. Uh, in fact, I've got a new episode of Conversations coming out tomorrow. We're going to talk about how network automation is a people problem. Ooh. Excellent. I can't wait to, to hear that, even though I think we've talked about it and I kind of know where you're going with it, but everyone should check that out. Uh, you can find it on Gestalt IT or youtube.com slash Gestalt IT video. If you are watching this live, that is where you are already. So why aren't you subscribing? Please do so. Um, and also like it, smash the like bell, ring the bell. I don't know. These are words that you're supposed to say on internet videos. Uh, you can find my stuff on gestaltit.com. In fact, uh, our new Checksum series now uh, has, uh, you know, is, is featured prominently uh, on the header of gestaltit.com. I just did a video talking all about uh, great stuff when it comes to, now I can't even remember what the subject of my video is because I'm working on two others right now, uh, but uh, lots of great stuff about the Jedi contract and kind of giving a status update on that this week and uh, going to be looking at all sorts of great stuff. So you want to check that out every Monday. Day, those videos are dropping. Uh, so we have a little stuff for you every day of the week here on, the, on Gestalt IT and specifically check some Gestalt IT rundown conversations. The hits never end, uh, but this show does. So you can find us back here at Wednesdays, 1230 p.m. Eastern time uh, on YouTube, Facebook, other platforms. So until the next time we meet for myself, for Tom Hollingsworth, for everyone here in the Gestalt IT family, here's wishing you and yours to have a super 